Hi, my name is Marcin Żebrowski and this is my podcast about cities, Herbcast. Hi and welcome to the newest episode of Herbcast, my podcast about cities, urbanism, architecture, urban planning, development and also people. And today I want to focus especially on people. I want to talk about the Urban Future Global Conference, which is, I would say, one of the biggest conferences uh, in Europe about the cities, about sustainable development, about smart cities, and in general about sharing the ideas behind the, how, should, how the cities should be created and managed. And I'm very happy to talk to Gerald Babel Sotter, who is the co-founder and CEO of Urban Future. Gerald is responsible for this whole crazy roller coaster journey that the urban future was so far. He is connecting passionate people who make cities sustainable. I need to say that it was very inspiring to talk to, to Gerald, who is very energetic, very charismatic and very good speaker. So welcome to our newest talk with Gerald. Welcome to, to Herbcast. Marcin, thank you for having me. I'm uh, very, very happy that you accepted my invitation. Probably you might be very busy with many activities being organized in, in urban future, but we'll come back to that. Before we start with the main topic, I wanted just to ask you to introduce yourself shortly to the listeners. Well, my name is Gerald. I'm CEO and co-founder of uh, The Urban Future. Um, I'm a father of four kids. I live in Graz, Austria, which is a city about of about 280,000 people in the south of Graz. And after a long time with uh, working with corporates, I think I've now found my true destiny. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm finally doing what I really love, uh, fully passionate into it. And it took me quite a while to figure that out uh, during my career. Mm, I'm very happy that you found your uh, desired hobby and desired passion and, and you could also connect it with work as, as I hope it is for you. How, how did it all start? I know that the, as far as I know, the, the conference started in Graz, but maybe before that, how did your interest in cities and urbanism and talking about this city related matter started? How did it start for you? Not at all planned. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. You know, I've been, it's been about 10 years ago now um, that I had a really cool corporate job in Austria, uh, working all of Europe and Eastern Europe um, for the biggest law firm in Europe. And um, I did marketing, business development, helped acquire new customers. And I had a, a really cool corporate career with lots of possibilities. I had headhunter, headhunters calling me. Uh, so, what, you know, what people would say, hey, this is a really cool life. But it was about that time that I met a woman that I totally fell in love with. And she happened to live in a different city, in the city of Graz, where I grew up and where I never wanted to be back in my entire life. So at one point, I needed to make a decision. She had uh, two kids in school, uh, so she wouldn't move. So I had to make a call. And eventually, I decided to change my life. And I... Uh, um, I quit my job. I moved to this boring city of Graz, or what I thought w would be the boring city of Graz. And uh, there I was looking for a new job. And I had very clear goals of what I wanted to do, you know, international firm and uh, executive position, blah, blah. And um, it just took me for longer than I thought uh, to actually land a job. So I helped out in, in a friend's company. You know, he, she asked me, you know, you got free time, you have consulting experience. Could you help me uh, on the project for the city? We're working on the project. I need a project manager who, who, who can kind of structure the whole thing. I said, sure, why not? Sounds interesting. And that happened to be a project on sustainable mobility. So within that project, it was really interesting. So I, I had no idea of the topic in general, but uh, given my consulting experience, I could kind of pretend on one end, but um, I could also really understand challenges and structure of project quite okay. So 
At one time during the project, we had drinks with the people from the city, with the project team from the city and the project manager. He said, Gerald, you know what? I really cannot hear the word smart city anymore. This is all bullshit. And I was there. I said, okay. And as the conversation kept going, he really talked a lot about what he meant with it. And he said, well, smart city is basically an idea on that technology solves every problem when it comes to sustainability. And it is focusing the conversation on what should be done. And he thinks that the what question is not the issue for a city. Because if you're a, working in a city or for a city and you want to make your city sustainable or decarbonize your city, the what question is obvious. Pretty much everybody knows, okay, we need to address uh, traffic, we need to address mobility, we need to address energy consumption, uh, consumption, and we need to address construction. And that would make a huge difference. So he said, in the end, the question is, how? How on earth are we going to do this without, you know, failing? So we took this home after, after that meeting. And it was interesting. It kept working with us, within us. And we came up with, with this proposal and we told them, listen, what do you say if we take your project and we're looking for similar projects from similar sized cities anywhere in the world who try to do what you're trying to do? And we, we invite the project managers from, from those projects and we let them talk about all the things that did not work when they tried to do it. So we didn't want to have the polished marketing, best practice, whatever write-ups. We wanted to have all the things that nobody would ever write in the report because all the things they fucked up or didn't work. And they loved it. They said, oh, that would be like really helpful. So we started to develop a workshop for them, strictly for the team of maybe 15 people from, from our client. But the thing was, they started to talk about it. With other cities, they, they, you know, and we got calls from other cities in Austria, from Vienna, from Salzburg, from Linz, and they said, "Oh, we heard about that workshop you were doing. Is there a way we can maybe send a couple of our people to to listen in?" Um, and we were like, "What the hell? You know, how do you even know?" <laughs> And at one point, we, to be honest, we, we got more annoyed with all the people calling us uh, than, than with the event itself. So, so we said, do you know what? Let's talk to the client. Maybe let, we, we can make this a public thing. And then we just throw out an event, an event bright thing and people sign up and good. And they said, yeah, they don't mind. So we did that. Uh, we rented a slightly bigger room. We threw it out on event bright and thought that was it. But it wasn't it. <laughs> the thing was, the whole thing took off like really fast. We, you know, we we thought we started with a workshop for twenty people. We figured, okay, well, maybe fifty people come up. When we hit two hundred and fifty, we were like, hmm, <laughs> we got to do something, you know, around it because there are so many people. We can't do a workshop for with two hundred fifty people. So we developed a small program around it, and we made a nice website and uh, we rented a few more rooms and it just kept going kept going kept going in the end it was an event for more than a thousand people from 32 countries and we had no we, like we were so unprepared for doing this <laughs> but it was the coolest event we have ever been to and most of the guests had ever been to and we were like what the hell just happened here uh, we had no clue what just happened to be honest and it was only after this first event that we really understood what happened when, when we started to look at who showed up and who came and who were the people that attended the conference. And it was uh, three things. We saw people would come from any discipline. You know, people, there, were, there were people with energy backgrounds, mobility backgrounds, architecture backgrounds, engineering backgrounds, uh, and so on. It was 30 different fields. We saw people who come from any organization. They would come from municipalities. Yeah, but they would, they would also come from from small businesses, large businesses, multinationals, NGOs, research organizations, civil organizations. There were even, you know, some civil activist, activist groups um, who, who participated. And the third thing is that we saw is people who come from any, let's call it hierarchy level. So we had mayors and deputy mayors there. Uh, we had board members, CEOs of companies. We had just regular people who work somewhere in sustainability on some sustainability project or a professor interested in sustainability or a student working on a student project and anything in between. 
And we were there and said, this is like everybody. This kind of, you know, that everybody who's in marketing knows everybody is usually not a good group to talk to. So we did some more interviews and luckily, luckily we found out that there's one thing that really glued all these people together. And that's that every single person who attended was extremely passionate about driving change themselves. So it was not the mayors or the urban planners or the architects. It was the passionate politicians. It was the passionate urban planners and the passionate architects who wanted to be part of making a huge change. And once we realized that, and once we got the, all these enthusiastic feedback from, from the audience from 30 different countries, that was the change of my career. And I said, okay, that was it. I don't need to find a new job. I, I just found myself a new job. And uh, we created uh, the urban future around it and made it an event for people who want to drive change in cities. And it kind of took off. Our last event in Oslo, um, we got more than 2,600 people from 58 countries together. And all they do is talk about how to drive change in cities. And the fun thing is, you know, you have so many, you know, if you look at news these days, uh, you've got all shitty news. Uh, it's not very upbeat, to be honest, uh, in particular since COVID came out. But even before, not really good news. We, in our team, we we're looking for all these cool stories. And we talk to all these cool people who do amazing things. And suddenly you see there's so much happening and so much good spirit around in cities anywhere in the world, whether they're rich or poor or whether they're, you know, have proper education or not, doesn't matter. Uh, there are people who are passionate about driving that transition that, that our planet needs. And that good vibes um, is really a big part of, of, of why I love that kind of job. <laughs> Geralt, you answered like my three following questions that I oh, had. Here we go. Are we done yet? <laughs> not yet. It's not that easy, but you, you answered uh, the following questions I had because I wanted to ask about this um, urban future beginning and how it all started. And I love this story behind it, that it was one big coincidence. And I believe that often those coincidences, they, they just create such amazing things in life. And I, I'm just happy to hear that it was a, this kind of unplanned coincidence that turned out to be this huge event oh i can even i can even make it worse it was so unplanned and we were so um how do you say unprepared for it and not really knowing what to get into that we set the dates and we started working for those dates and uh, once we start to approach international speakers you know every now and then we would have people telling us oh is that you know when, when is it happening and we gave them the dates and they said isn't that the same date as Barcelona and uh, you know the first time in the meeting we were like yeah it is and they said okay and after the second and third time it happened I went back to the team and said hey what the fuck is happening in Barcelona um, and and my <laughs> my colleague she, she, she came back and said oh Gerald this you know this seems to be the biggest smart city event in the world and we're like oh <laughs> <laughs> that might be a problem <laughs> But, but it, it was not, quite to the contrast, actually. People loved it that we do exactly the same way. And a lot of people that we attracted uh, on, on those dates, they said, uh, we want to do something differently. So, but, you know, it, it, it just happened. This, this is really something you couldn't have planned. And because of that, because it's not planned, it was not a business case. We had, we had no clue how to, how to sustain it over the years at that time. We just had the feeling that there's something people want and they don't get anywhere out there so far. So um, it took us quite some time to work on how we could actually make this happen. Because if we do an event every year, we need a huge team. This is really a big undertaking the way we want to do it. So, uh, so we need a team of, you know, currently we're about 10 people working full time on making uh, the Urban Future events happening. I think it was a perfect timing. And here I would like to put a, a, a date. When was the first event? So when was this kind of big surprise that turned into this huge event? When was it? Was it 2015? 
It was actually 2014 that we had uh, the first event here in Graz. We did another one then two years later, also in Graz. And that was already so big that we kind of maxed out the city. So it was uh, we, we didn't get any hotel rooms anymore. And it was very difficult for our international guests to even get there. The flight routes to the city of Graz, uh, they have been in a monopoly from the Lufthansa group. So the prices were like astronomical. So we figured we have to you know, move somewhere else and then other cities keep approaching us and then it became an annual event and then it was like Vienna uh, in 2018 and then Oslo in 2019 and uh, subsequently it was supposed to be Lisbon in Portugal and Rotterdam in the Netherlands, but unfortunately those got Corona the way. Yes, exactly. And that's that's why I wanted to talk to you so much, because I was hearing a lot of positive things about this conference back in Oslo. I, I've heard like tons of people from uh, all the sustainability and urbanism field uh, attending this conference. Some of my friends just sharing some extremely interesting and amazing stories. And I was completely bought in. I bought my tickets to Lisbon and I was extremely happy to see you, to see all the other participants, to, to see the whole team and just to attend such a huge event. And then, of course, Corona came. <laughs> and I don't want to, of course, say and ask like, OK, blah, blah, how the pandemic influenced you, because, of course, it hit you and you as an organization, I guess, very badly. But I see that you kind of tackled it in a very nice way. And I wanted to ask about this in a, in a bit. But before that, you said about this unexpected success in a way from every edition from year to year was even more successful and bigger. And when the Corona came and you've been preparing for this edition in Lisbon, like what was your first thought like? Wasn't it like a one huge crisis management to be able to make this decision if you call off the event or you should try to make it happen? Or what, what were your feelings as a team where, where Corona was coming and you've been spending so many hours, I can assume, preparing the event. And then unfortunately, at the end, you had to have this decision of canceling the event. Well, I think the first reaction was shit. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's very, very difficult to say. I mean, we have been working for more than two years on this event um, and uh, many people, not only in our team at Urban Futures, but also at the city of Lisbon, put lots of heart and passion into it. Uh, we had, uh, you know, partner organizations doing uh, delegations from places like Australia, uh, Seoul to Canada and uh, Argentina. So we got lots of people lined up and, and very much looking forward to it. And, you know, it was still in February, I think early February, when a friend called me up and said, hey, what are we going to do about Corona? And I said, why would I care about Corona? You know, that, that's, that's China. And I had, I, we had no clue, to be honest. And then things developed so rapidly in Europe that when we, when we grasped this, when we really understood what the hell is going on and, and you know, projecting this forward, luckily we had great support from the health authorities in Portugal. And even though... Portugal at that point had two people infected, two. That was early March, and the event was supposed to be start on April 1st. They said, even though we have two people now, we can expect by April 1st to have about 3,000. And we can expect pretty much any country in Europe being in a lockdown. So that was not really an option, whether or not to move forward or not. So... The first thing is we let everybody know, unfortunately, that the event is not going to happen due to this crisis. We had no, no idea how, you know, how this would turn out in the end for us as a team. It was very tough because that meant that we have been working for a year. All the sponsors and all the ticket holders, um, you know, at least all the sponsors and partners wanted their money back. The exhibitors, they didn't pay anything. Uh, so we have basically no income. Uh, luckily, the community, you know, after the first week of horror, we saw that there is actually a community who wants us to be out there. And we had more than 50% of people who already held tickets. They said, fine, you know, keep the money. We, um, we come to the next event with it. And that, you know, that helped us through in big parts 
also the partnership with Lisbon. They were an amazing partner in it. Uh, they they were not in it for you know the quick thing. They wanted um, a long term effect, and uh, they were a strong partner. They helped us a lot in surviving that. And basically, we then started working on on, on the next event in Rotterdam. We knew that it's not going to work to reschedule this event in that year. And it turned out to be a correct assessment. There would have been no way to do this event in 2020. So we focused right away on Rotterdam in 2021. You know, with with such a strange environment of COVID, nobody knows what you know what's going to happen. The regulations are changing every week, whether people can meet or not, and where and under what circumstances. So we actually planned six different setups for the event in Rotterdam. Until eventually, in late December, we decided to postpone it uh, because the risk was getting too big. You know, doing an event of that size is an investment of more than a million euros. And we would have to do that investment without knowing, you know, is anybody able to come? Is anybody allowed to come? Is anybody willing to come and get together? So we postponed it into 24. But um, it was a tough time for the team. You know, because you, they have been working on this moment for a long time. And then it got shattered. And then after a week or so, we said, okay, let's get up. Let's get back on the feet and let's work on, on Rotterdam on the next event. And we work and work and work and work and, and, and things develop and, and take in shape. And then it's shattered again. Uh, it is, you know, that, on a personal side, this is really demotivating, you know, because you never see the outcome of your work. Exactly. And, and this is why I asked, because I've tried to get this personal feeling, this attachment. And I'm asking because I've been organizing a conference myself. It was a conference for like 400 students. It was a, a conference about cities. And we've been doing it for a year with a team of 15. and. At the end, I, I can say that if the event would have been canceled, all this one year of working, I, I mean, it would demotivate me completely. But you were strong and uh, you just changed the format of the conference. And here I would like to say a bit about this brilliant formula that you came up with. So you kind of started to rebranding the urban future. And it's not longer only a conference, it's a community with both let's hope, like live physical events in cities and also online events. So maybe let's start first with the physical events, because you are, of course, planning the future congresses as well, the future gatherings. And one of them the next year will be in Sweden and I will do everything to attend it. It's so close from Copenhagen. But please tell me, like you've been <laughs> you've had so much demotivation in a way, and also so many problems, challenges with COVID. And how was to plan one more event that is due to happen the next year? And also you've planned many more events for the next three years, I think. So how is this setup working for you? Well, Martin, I, I think I'm, I'm a person who always tries to see the positive side in things, even you know, if it's, if it's a really bad moment, uh, whether it's in personal life, you know, if, if your partner leaves you, uh, it's like, oh, my God. But at one point, you will realize it was good for something. Um, you might not know it at that point, <laughs> and you might not want to see it at that point. But it usually is. Things happen for a reason, and that, that's what we kept saying to ourselves. And because of the team, everybody on the team is so passionate about what we do, because, you know, when you have, if you had experienced this life event in Oslo, for example, the power and the energy that's happening there, it's like a, it's like a supercharger for motivation. Addictive, very addictive. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, it's, it's very addictive. Total addiction. <laughs> so when COVID hit, we were like, okay, what does that mean to us? So we we, we worked on you know, what what are the effects on on our work, and as the more and more we saw doing one event a year is actually quite risky because if something happens, it, it puts the whole thing in danger. And I'm not only talking about the business aspect of it um, as, as, you know, as we need, you know, to get everybody's paycheck and time, but we are putting 
the issue at risk. Um, because to a lot of people, we we do really good things. Uh, we inspire them, we motivate them to take action. So when we had some spare time to actually think about things that had been in the backs of our minds for quite some while, we looked at what it is that we really did. Yes, we did events and we got people together, but what we didn't see initially or during you know, the very stressful preparations of for events, what we didn't see is that within just four years, we were able to create a community of more than 50,000 people around the world who, who were following what we do, who, who were following the kind of stories that we share and the content that we share and the inspiration that we share. And just parts of these people were from Europe. They were actually from South America. They were from Africa, from Indonesia, from anywhere in the world. It was more than 150 countries. And on top of that, suddenly things started to make sense because we keep getting requests from people from outside Europe. Uh, how could they attend the event? Uh, how could they maybe access streams of the uh, live streams for the event, etc.? And we figured, well, we should be doing something for them, uh, for this huge community, because if we were able to reach in, in, in just four years such a huge community, I bet there are many more people out there how, you know, how can we motivate them? How can we inspire them to take action? And just imagine, just imagine if you have 50,000 people taking action in their city, what that could make a difference, how much this could make a difference. So that was the idea. And then we thought, okay, well, let's, let's develop something. How can we get that inspiration and how, how can we get that motivation to more people? And then, you know, then we thought, a virtual event might be an opportunity to do that because then, you know, people don't have to travel and many more people could access it than a live event. And that's how we started to think about how could we develop uh, a virtual format. You said initially that we take the urban future virtual. It's something completely different simply because we think the experience of meeting people in person connecting in the city, experiencing the city, that's something you can't, you just cannot replicate in the virtual world. But there are some things that you can do really well. So you can talk really well about inspiration, about motivation. You can share skills that make sense to people. So this is, this will be the focus of the virtual event this September. And we are um, heads over heels in that project right now. We will be having close to 500 partners <laughs> working, working on this project. It's totally crazy, but it shows the big interest for people to, to make an impact. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty cool. So that's, that's the virtual track, so to say. And the live events, I think there we have a really good concept. We have a very good understanding on how to produce them. And we have a lot of cities that are interested in you know, doing something like that. So we have Helsingborg, a small city in Sweden, lining up for next year. In 2023, we're going to be in Stuttgart, Germany, which is going to be really interesting because, you know, that's the epicenter of the automobile industry in Germany. And they're usually the bad guys. So going with, with Europe's biggest sustainability conference for cities in a city that's the heart of the automobile industry it's really cool for a conversation, to frame a conversation, because we're totally convinced that it's not the conversation about sustainable cities. It's not for or against something or somebody. It's all about collaboration and about doing things together and making change happen together. And an important industry that is such a critical industry to Europe and to basically anywhere in the world, they, they have to be part of this solution in the end. So having this conversation in their you know, hometown, uh, I think is pretty cool. So that's 20, uh, 23. 23. Yes. Yeah. For 24, uh, we're expecting to be in Rotterdam. That's when, where we moved this year's event to. And um, for 25 and 6, we're currently talking to a couple of European cities. But uh, what's, uh, what's really cool is that we're now being approached by cities from other regions. So we're actually working on a first Asia-Pacific urban future event. 
And uh, we have started uh, to, to discuss with key partners an African edition uh, for the live event. And I think that's, that's a big difference to virtual events where you might be able to find common denominators in a topic that's equally interesting to wherever the people are. If you do the live event, it's a lot about the topic like mobility or housing or whatever. And they are very specific in the different regions. Uh, you know, if, if we talk about our mobility problems in Europe, African cities, they can just laugh at us and say, I wish we had that problem. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you have to put that into perspective. So, so doing local, uh, local events, that's, that's pretty cool, pretty helpful, hopefully. You said that you've started with a vast variety of the guests who, who attended the, the conference. Yeah. And I hope that it will stay the same. So there will be many different people from many different fields. And I just wanted to ask, just thinking uh, from a perspective of a listener and someone who might have heard about you, but maybe haven't attended the, the, one of the events yet. What can I expect and how could I get involved? I know that you also target uh, some uh, young leaders. And if there are some young people listening to us, how can they get involved? So what, the, what are the opportunities out there for someone who would love to get involved and meet people, make difference? Well, there are many opportunities. Um, I mean, the live events naturally are a great meeting place for people of any, any background. And uh, that's what people are using to. But um, on top of that, in September of this year, we're going to launch um, a virtual platform called citychangers.org. It's currently in the making. And that's where we want all of our community to share their know-how on how to drive change. And it's very much focused on the question of how do you do things and not what to do. So if we, for example, talking about how do I introduce a pedestrian zone, for example, in my city, it shows exactly step by step where to start, where to keep going, what are the critical issues, what are the mistakes you can do, what are the stakeholders uh, you should get involved, etc. Very practical, very hands-on. And with the input of practitioners from all around the world. And it's very much community-driven. So people who actually do this, share this openly. So this could be a very good opportunity for, for people who want to get involved to connect with peers anywhere in the world. So that's, that, that's one. And um, other than that, I think people should always do what they love and what their passion is for. So if you start looking, uh, you find people everywhere. You find them in your city, you find them in your networks, you find them on LinkedIn or Facebook, Twitter, wherever you find them in your university. And, um, Yeah, it's so easy these days to reach out to people and, and, and start a conversation. And it's most of the time, it's doing the first step. <laughs> just, you know, just go out and do it. That's what I'm trying to do with my podcast. That's why we are talking. And, and I'm, I'm very happy that you shared all this um, knowledge and, and all this. Uh, I mean, that was a crazy ride for you. I, can, I, can, I can't just imagine, like, how was it for you to, to, to have this initial success and then the COVID hits and then you are just, you know, fighting with it and, and trying to get back on your legs and continue. And, 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 and that's, that's brilliant. That's, that's to me like a, a success story. And I'm very happy that, that you are sharing all this. So one more time, I want to just to emphasize that I hope that we will be able to meet in Sweden and in, and in other cities as well. And Yeah, I mean, to, to summarize it in a, in a way, I would say that you are like a very special community driven conference. It's, it's not only an event, it's, it's not only event organized by some company, it's, uh, it's based on, the, on this community. And that's, I think, extraordinary in this. I think this is what, what it makes really, really unique. You know, we did not start with the business model and then said, okay, this is what we need. We are not a tech expo that's trying to sell, um, you know, square meters. This is, this is an event or a group or a community with a mission. We want to change cities. We want to make better cities and we want to find ways so that we can hopefully somehow turn around and rescue this planet before it's too late. And with that passion in place, a lot of things happen with the, you know, just because the right people are joining together we tend to attract the right kind of people, the right kind of companies, the ones with, with the shared mindset. And that makes it so 
um, so great to be right in the middle of it because people just come, you know, they, they're attracted to, to it. Um, and uh, we see this happening when we're looking for speakers, for example. The, the program in Lisbon was co-created by more than 500 people that provided input, shared ideas, shared stories, uh, got suggestions of, of potential speakers and topics. And they're so much engaged with, you know, so passionate themselves that, you know, it's hard not to be happy about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we are. So, so, we, so we are happy <laughs> and trying to find ways uh, to, to help this community. Uh, help them get better, help them get more effective and, and, and be better change makers. Oh, yes, that's true. The number of great and knowledgeable guests was almost overwhelming. It was such a group of inspiring people that, that I really regret not attending this. But let's go further. Let's let's think about the future. And I think that was a very nice summary, a very nice closing statement. And let me just move on to the last uh, part of our talk, because I would I would really like to ask you for um, some book recommendation. Would you would you have one? Oh, that's a long list. <laughs> it can be two. <laughs> it's a long list. But but I think what I really like, um, a book that, that I really liked is a book by a very interesting person that had been guest at our first Open Future, Benjamin Barber. Um, unfortunately, he died in the meanwhile, but he wrote a book, uh, If Mayors Ruled the World. And it's basically about the power cities have in driving transitions. And I think he couldn't be more right because that's something that we see right now happening anywhere in the world. We have cities, big or small, making decisions independently from their national governments. Uh, they're taking the lead. They collaborate on international, across borders, without not so much politics as it is on national level. You have... American and Russian cities collaborating as it is with uh, Brazilian and European cities collaborating on huge things. And the impact that even cities can have is substantial. So that's a book I, you know, I can suggest to anybody because it also shows that even if you're small, uh, you, you can do things, uh, amazing things. And there are no limits to what you can achieve. That's a book that I have on my reading list. And now I think that when you just so passionately shared this, this ideas behind this book, I will just read it very, very soon. And of course, I will add this, um, this book in, this, uh, in the episode description because I've heard also that it's extremely interesting and I, I would just also uh, recommend it to the listeners. And before we finish, I wanted also to ask where people, where listeners can find your work, where can they sign up for the events, where can they be a part of, of Urban Future? Well, we have the Urban Future website, which is um, urban-future.org. It is a pre preliminary website. We're going to launch with a huge new website and campaign on July 1st. So keep that in mind, July 1st. But, you know, you can also look at our social media channels on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. You could also look out for my personal profile on LinkedIn, where I share a lot of things. It's a great community of people. We share things and stories. So social media is a good place these days if you know what you're looking for. <laughs> yes, we've been kind of forced to turn on this uh, social media mode and uh, online mode, but I hope we will get back to the physical communication, to real life and uh, talking to other people. And I hope that it will be possible to happen in Sweden next year. And I hope to see you there. And for now, I wanted to thank you very much, Gerald, for our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Martin, thanks for having me at the show. And um, we see you in Helsingborg. Thank you for listening to the newest talk with Gerald. And I'm very happy to share this crazy story of his and his team from creating this spontaneous gathering for city lovers, expanding to thousands of people following their work and being able to meet physically in one place. And I hope that soon we will be able to meet with all those people in the future edition of the Urban Future, which will take place in Helsingborg in 2022. I am planning to be there. It's a very close distance from Copenhagen. It's just a train ride. 
So I'm going to be there for sure. And I hope that I encouraged you to, to see the event, to check the website and also to attend the event in a live or online form. Thank you and see you soon.